All right, looks like the recording's working now. So this is our quotient rule, the rule for when you're dividing two things. And just like before, I'm going to take out my highlighter. We've got two different notations. And we're going to highlight the top of our function in yellow, and then highlight where that all stays the same in both notations. And we'll highlight the bottom of our function in green and highlight everywhere where that stays the same in both functions. So if you thought that the product rule was a little bit complex because you kept one the same derivative of the other one and then kept the other one the same derivative of the other one, the quotient rule says keep the bottom the same, then multiply by the derivative of the top, then keep the top the same and multiply by the derivative of the bottom, and do the derivative of the bottom squared. Whew. In the product rule, it doesn't matter the order. In the quotient rule, the order matters. You have to keep the bottom the same first because there's a subtract sign. In the product rule, you were adding. So if you mixed them up and did one first and not the other one, you didn't follow the formula exactly, you'd get exactly the same answer. But in the quotient rule, it is important that you do the bottom first. There it is. And then the derivative of the top then subtract, keep the top the same, derivative of the bottom over the bottom squared. So what does this look like? The bottom is 3x minus 7, the top is x cubed. So we would keep the bottom the same, multiply by the derivative of the top, subtract, keep the top the same, multiply by the derivative of the bottom over the bottom squared. And then you would go and you would look at your answer key in one like this. I'm just going to give a rough guess at what I think the answer key might have in this one. I think they would have the 3x minus 7 on the bottom all squared. And on the top, I think they would have 3x squared and then 2x minus 7. How did I go from up here to here? Do you see what they did? What would be your interim step? Can you see? Obviously, the bottom didn't change, so I'll leave that the same. That in these, this term and this term, there's something in common. They both have 3's, and they both have x squareds. So you could factor out a 3x squared. Can you see that that would leave you with still the 3x minus 7 from the first one? But when I take out a 3x squared from the second one, I would be left with a minus x. And then in the brackets, the 3x and the minus x are like terms. That would become 2x minus 7. So in this term, I see a 3x squared. In this term, I see a 
and an x cubed, but there's an x squared in there as well. And so I can say there's a common factor in those two terms. I can pull that 3x squared out. If I pull a 3x squared out of the first term, I'm left with 3x minus 7. If I pull a 3x squared out of the second term, I'm left with x. Then 3x minus x would be 2x. And what we've done is we have simplified the top. Even better, we've simplified and turned it into multiplication, which if there was a factor that was the same on the bottom, that would be even better. So even more than the multiplication, when you get to the homework in the quotient law, there will be more work to do to try to make it look like the answer. Find f prime of x. Keep the top, sorry, keep the bottom the same. Multiply by the derivative of the top. 2x plus 5. Minus, keep the top the same. x squared plus 5x minus 3. Multiply by the derivative of the bottom, which will be 3 minus 28x cubed. All over 3x minus 7x to the 4, the whole bottom squared. So again, you really need to know your power rule memorized because you do it so often, it would be annoying if you, every time you had to look at a formula sheet. So that's why we're sort of leaning towards making sure we have all of our rules memorized as much as possible for working with these. Is there anything we can factor out of the top? Anything in common in this term and this term? In this situation, no. So this would probably be how it would final answer. They might multiply things out on the top and simplify it just to annoy you. Okay? Generally on my quizzes and tests, unless I ask you to simplify, you can just write the answer in one step like this, which is kind of nice. Now it comes to a point at this time in the unit where we've done derivatives, we've done derivatives, and sometimes we do derivatives long enough that you forget what you're actually finding. What is a derivative? A derivative, when you find the derivative, you're finding an equation to find the tangent of any, or I mean to find the slope of any tangent line anywhere on a graph. So in this question it says, Find the slope of a tangent at x equals negative 1. So if I find y prime, I find an equation for all the slopes. y prime would be, keep the bottom the same, derivative of the top, keep the top the same, derivative of the bottom, over the bottom squared. Right? We'll call it a formula. Just as good to remind ourselves what we're actually doing. Y prime is the formula, the equation for all the slopes of all the tangent lines. If you want to find the slope of the tangent when x is equal to 1, well, when x is equal to negative 1, y prime would equal 1 plus 1 times 3 plus negative 1 times negative 2 all over 2 squared. All I did was plug in negative 1 wherever there was an x. Now when I simplify this, I'm going to get 
6 plus 2 is 8 divided by 4. So I know the slope of the tangent line is equal to 2. Now we need to find y equals mx plus b. So to find an equation of a, of a tangent line, you need the slope, okay? We've already got that. We figured that out already, that m was 2. Did I make a... Oh, I added, thank you. Good I. This should be a subtract sign. And then I copied it here. And then it would be 4 over 4, where you're right, so that would be 1. Good. So to find an equation, you need the slope, which we got eventually to be m equals 1. And a point, which we almost have. We know the x value is negative 1. But how do we find that y value of that point? Well, you would have to plug negative 1 not into y prime because you're looking for a point that's actually on the graph. You would plug that negative 1 back into your original equation. And can you see that you would get negative 1 in your numerator and 2 in your denominator? So now we have our point as well. So you find slopes by plugging a value into the derivative, because that's what the derivative is there for. You find the actual point by plugging the value into the equation. Now that we have both of those things, uh, for those of you that like y equals mx plus b, you can plug in negative 1 half for y, 1 for m, negative 1 for x, Add them together, and you get b is equal to 1 half. So the equation is y equals x plus 1 half. I'd like to show you a visual of what you just figured out. Well, it's war. Well, yeah, we can wait. You guys are patient with my slow computer, right? Hello. All right, we are going to write the equation that we just did, which was x cubed divided by x squared plus 1. Do you know what the graph of x cubed divided by x squared plus 1 looks like? Probably not. Oh, kind of looks like a tangent graph bent on its side. Now, if we move this tangent to negative 1. This is going to take some uh, fine-tuned moving of pixels. 0.98, you see how the point... Oh, come on. Oh, oh, oh. 
is I should be able to hit it, right? I've hit 1.02, 9, 9, 9, 8. Let me zoom in a little bit more. Perfect. So what we've got here is we've got this, this tangent line at that point. What we found when we did the derivative if I drag this point all along here, that's a cool looking little shape, eh? It's like, um, what does that look like? I don't know, like a pothole, right? You're driving along a nice straight road, boom, hit a pothole, and then you drive straight again. This blue thing that I just drew by dragging that curve, that is this graph. Right? Right? You can now take this formula home and show your parents and say, this is the problem with Winnipeg Road. This equation right here. And they'd be like, what? Yes. If you look at it, that is, that is the problem with Winnipeg Roads. And then you could say, well, if you graph it, you'd understand. And then you get the pothole that we saw right there. So that's graphically what we've done. What we see here is our original graph, something we don't know how to graph very well. Then we have the graph of the derivative, and the graph of the derivative is just plotting every single slope of every single tangent line. And then the equation that we found was that one right there when x was equal to negative 1. All right, here is one of the show that ones. This is very similar to what you'll see in your homework. You've got your original equation. You want to show that the derivative is equal to what you see second. And then you want to find out where the derivative is undefined. So first of all, if I want to find dy dx, I have a quotient rule. How do I do a quotient rule? I keep the bottom the same. Multiply by the derivative of the top, 2x minus 3. Subtract, keep the top the same. Multiply by the derivative of the bottom. And the derivative of x plus 2 will just be 1 all over x plus 2 squared. So we follow our format for how do we find the derivative of a quotient. Now that we have that, we need to show that it's equal to this. And I'll tell you in these questions, they're kind of like mini proofs. You need to do the algebra to make them look the same. When I am doing something like this, I observe, hey, the bottoms are already the same. I already have an x plus 2 squared in both of them. So chances are I just need to do something with my numerators to make it work. Then you look at your numerator and say, what could I do? Well, I could multiply things out and distribute my negative. So what would happen if I multiplied things out? Bottom will still be x plus 2 squared. I would get 2x squared minus 3x plus 4x plus x minus 6, and distribute this negative, minus x squared plus 3x minus 1. Do I have some like terms? Yes, I do. I'll combine those. 2x squared minus that will be x squared. x plus 3x plus 4x, negative 6 minus 1, negative 7, over x plus 2 squared. Now check, does that match up with the, what they wanted to show? Yes. Where is the derivative undefined? Because that's the second part of the question. Hence, find all the values where the derivative is undefined. Well, when you're looking for where something is defined and undefined, that's talking about its domain and what is possible 
and what is not possible. And usually it's easiest to see where things are not possible. dy dx is undefined when x equals negative 2. Because that would cause you to divide by 0. If x is negative 2, it's not possible. If we do the same thing we did with the last one and look at this equation, our original equation x squared over, oh, I shouldn't have done that, x squared minus 3x plus 1. I have to remember it all in my head. Uh-oh. Divided by x plus 2. Is that what it was? x squared minus 3x plus 1 divided by x plus 2. I need to put the top in brackets. Yeah, let's get rid of that. There we go. x squared minus 3x plus 1 all divided by x plus 2. Enter. Let's clear everything. There we go. That's an interesting looking graph. Kind of is like a parabola that went sideways. Interestingly enough, if you zoom out far enough, it looks like this. For those of you that have done some of the grade 12 pre-calculus already, there is some news. Um, this is one with an oblique asymptote. It has a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 2, it also has an oblique asymptote. If we look at what the derivative looks like, there we go. Hmm. Cool. Notice how it flattens out? This, whatever the oblique asymptote is, will be what the derivative flattens out to because it gets closer and closer to that line, so it would get closer and closer to having that slope. And what were we looking for in this question? Where is it undefined? Can you see in both the original graph and the derivative graph that there is an asymptote at x equals negative 2? Okay, I'm going to ask you a limits question based on the graph. You have another 10 seconds to look and memorize both of these graphs. Okay. And was it originally y equals? Yep. Some interesting notation here. I didn't want to rewrite out x squared minus 3x plus 1 over x plus 2, so I just wrote y because it was equal to that. And I didn't want to rewrite all of dy dx, so I just wrote dy dx. Are you OK with that notation? OK, do you remember from the graph, what's the answer to this? No? How about this one? Would you agree that this one, I'll show you. We'll go back to the graph. What happens from the left and the right-hand side of the derivative as you get closer and closer to negative 2? You see that both the blue graphs from both sides goes down to negative infinity. 
So we would say that the limit as x approaches 2 on the derivative is negative infinity. But the limit as x approaches negative 2 on the original function does not exist because look at the original function, the black line, one goes down to negative infinity, the other one goes up to positive infinity. The left side limit and the right side limit are different. Yes, sorry, negative 2. I just missed that. Yeah, because 2, it, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so 15 minutes left. Again, same idea. Do a question, check the answer key. There's going to be more simplification that happens with the quotient rule. 